All right, and uh, fortunately we had some money from the Swine Health Information Center. Uh, we developed what's called the Rapid Response Program several years ago, so credit Paul Sundberg for uh, funding that. And so we've got a team of veterinarians, myself included, that are um, we're trying to get prepared and trained to go out and do outbreak investigations when they occur so that we can learn from them. And so we had this one, which is particularly interesting, happened last uh, winter. Uh, started about November of 2021 and then uh, kind of uh, went through January 24th of 2022. We had uh, about 20 cases during that short window of time. All of those cases uh, were identified through submissions to the Iowa State University Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And uh, when those started coming in, the, the pathologists uh, down there were curious about whether or not other diagnostic labs were seeing a similar spike in cases, and it turned out they weren't. And so uh, that was interesting, right? It was only it seemed to be uh, cases that were coming from uh, com to the Iowa State Diagnostic Lab there. Uh, they were all, all 20 cases were on wind to market sites or finishing sites, uh, and there were nine uh, different production systems involved. We uh, invested some extra time on seven of those 20 cases and did a more intensive outbreak uh, investigation on those, uh, where the primary objective of those was then to assess how the bacteria was being transmitted from one uh, herd to another there. And we're preparing a case report on that, or a publication for the Journal of Swine Health and Production Medicine. It should be out uh, hopefully soon. And so when we uh, got into this, we had, what we discovered then is not only were all those cases coming to the ISU VDL, they were all in a fairly uh, tight geographic area. In fact, uh, almost all of them except one were in, in uh, Hamilton and, and Hardin County there. And as you can see, there was one up here in Franklin County, but, but again, a relatively small area uh, these were coming from. And so that creates a uh, interesting question, right? Why, why, why are they all right there uh, during this time frame and apparently nowhere else? Time-wise, uh, again, you can see the first one here was November 25th, uh, had one that week, none the next, uh, or the, uh, yeah, none the next week, had a couple the week after that, and then uh, that, that third week of December there uh, had that uh, derecho happen in the middle of that, um, that week on the 15th. Uh, spawned uh, 61 tornadoes and had some 70 mile an hour straight line winds there. And, and that seemed to uh, instigate a, a little bit of a spike in the number of cases. So I had two, two right after that that week, three the next week, four the week after that, and then they extended all the way into January the 24th there. So, Question was, uh, well, maybe maybe there was some aerosol transmission. Could that be possible? Uh, maybe it had something to do with the stre with stress, right? So stress might uh, just instigate the onset of the disease. All these cases were hard to miss. There was uh, a lot of pigs dying, and so the, the onset was, was pretty easy to see. This was uh, from just one of the production systems. This was one that got hit a little bit harder than the others. Um, each one of these charts represents one case, one site, and the number represents sort of peak weekly mortality. So what's plotted on here is weekly mortality, how many pigs died as a percentage of the total placed each week. And, and so you can see it r ranged uh, quite, quite a bit, uh, a lot of variation there. Uh, this was the worst case. They lost over half their pigs in one week uh, to APP 15. So APP serotype 15, uh, Outbreak investigation, we did this um, with an instrument that we developed uh, for the breeding herd, again, through the rapid response program. Uh, we do these as basically a, a hazard analysis. So uh, we use the three failures concept. We're looking similar to what Jordan described there. Uh, we're looking for uh, hazards that may have led to something, pathogen carrying agent, we call them something that could have carried the virus or bacteria in this case. Uh, from one herd to another, so we look for uh, uh, failures of uh, that would failure to prevent contamination uh, or infection, failure to mitigate that, and then the third failure happens once those pathogen carrying agents arrive at the farm. And there's a transfer or transmission of the virus, or in this case, bacteria, to the pigs in the herd. So we use that that concept. We incorporate any epidemiological information we have, like operational connections, uh, events that happened during the investigation period, and so forth. Uh, we used an, a 14-day investigation period, so that's where we focused our efforts. We wanted to understand what happened during that time, right? Uh, I sometimes describe it as, as the who, what, when, where, and how. Who did, who did what, what did they do, and how they do it, and so forth. And so that's uh, what we did. And, and again, these are pretty intensive, so we, we picked seven or did seven of the 20 uh, cases that, that occurred during that short window. Um, all of those, again, were in finisher sites. 
uh, or when to finish sites, um, most of them were in either mid to late finishing phase. You had this one exception here uh, that happened in late nursery, but that was the exception even out of the 20 cases. There was only one of these occurred in, in the nursery. And uh, we kind of tried to target this. We were, we were looking for, uh, for, for the first case in the company. So not only how did it get in that site, but how did it get in the company? Because uh, within companies, you've got lots of operational connections, right? Uh, sharing trailers, sharing people, those kinds of things. But there's less of those between companies. Now, as it turns out, there's still a lot of those as well. Uh, but we were trying to focus on those. So, so four of the, of the cases that we investigated were the first case in the company, and then the other three were, uh, were not the first case. Uh, outbreak mortality, this, this was not just weekly. This would have been either one or two or three weeks where the peak uh, outbreak uh, occurred, uh, but again, ranged quite a bit there. And then uh, stress events, uh, these are things like, uh, in one case, there was a power outage, water outage. In another case, there was a power outage and the curtain failed to drop. Uh, or in uh, one case, they, they simply were uh, emptying a barn. And, and so they had most of the pigs out of one barn, uh, had, had already been marketed, and then uh, they, they just moved those, simply moved those to another barn uh, that had not been uh, completely marketed yet. And that, that movement event apparently was enough stress, or hypothesized that anyway, that that set off the outbreak. And, and so again, th three uh, of the seven, or four of the seven, had some sort of stress event uh, involved with the onset. And then dead removal, um, all but two of the seven we investigated uh, used rendering. Okay, so that's very common in, in this part of the state yet uh, to use rendering, uh, especially in the wean to market phase of production. And so actually those two that use composting, that was about the only two out of the 20 that use composting, the rest use rendering. And then interestingly enough, there were two of these cases where not all of the barns on the site got infected, okay? So they, they had the outbreak in one of, of one or two or three of, of, of multiple barns or one or two of multiple barns there. And, and so to me that kind of demonstrates that, that it's not that easy to move this bacteria around, okay? And, and so they weren't doing anything extraordinary um, to try to keep it from moving with one barn to another. In one case, they were trying to change boots. Uh, they changed the order they chored and went from the, the, the unaffected barn to the affected barns but nothing extraordinary, and they were able to keep it out of those in, in two of these seven cases. And so it is actually pretty hard to move this bacteria around, but <laughs> we found 20 cases where that happened here. All right, and then, so what do we learn? This is probably the biggest take home right here. Uh, you know, we knew rendering was an important feature uh, for these uh, 20 cases, or was, was a common feature. Um, but when we started uh, in talking about that uh, during the investigations, it was pretty apparent that that nobody really knew much about how that was done, right? There is a single company um, that operates in, in Iowa that picks up dead pigs and they're uh, darling located here in Des Moines. And, but nobody really had a good idea how they operated, right? And so the question we had again, why, why just this small area, right? And, and could, could there be something about rendering that may explain that, right? Or how rendering was done. And, and so it turns out then, uh, and again, none of the veterinarians uh, knew this ahead of time, uh, but we got on a call with, with, uh, with Darling and they were very helpful uh, helping us understand this, but they have, uh, they basically geographically segregate their operations. So they have uh, what they call a reload station up here in Belmond. Um, uh, the, the yellow dots up here is the cases, uh, the, the 20 APP uh, serotype 15 cases. And, um, Turns out they, they, this reload station then, they have defined roughly, this is, this is not this clear, but uh, it's not that clean, I should say, but they have a geographic area then uh, that operates uh, where the trucks and the drivers operate around Belmont. And basically it's the smaller trucks, the straight trucks that pick up the dead pigs uh, in the country. They pick them up, they bring them back to Belmont here, and then they get transferred to a larger 52-foot uh, uh, trailer that goes, comes and brings them down to Des Moines. So it's, it's done for logistics. Right, inefficiency. You bring in a bigger, bigger truck down to Des Moines. You're not, you're not having all those smaller trucks uh, driving to back and forth from Des Moines. And so, again, nobody knew this. We discovered this, I guess, through the conversation. And and so that, you know, again, is, that's kind of interesting from the standpoint, maybe of answering the question of why just in this small area. And the other thing we tried to figure out is the specific routes. So that would have been helpful too. That's the other thing, right? A lot of times these pigs get, uh, dead pigs get picked up and nobody's there, right? So no, there's very little known about 
how that happens and sometimes when, right? And, and sure, there's an invoice somewhere, uh, but, but you have to really dig to get those. And then it turns out we probably could have got uh, to, uh, we probably could have understood this better than we, we ended up being able to, but uh, we had some limitations on what information uh, they would, or were willing to share with us, and so we, we kind of just left it at this. But, but pretty clearly here, that, you know, that sort of, to me, answers the question, why just in this small, small area? Now, I'm not saying rendering was involved in all these cases, but I think it was probably almost certainly involved in some of them here. All right, uh, the other thing that was, happened, there was two of the seven cases were actively in the marketing phase. Uh, there was a third that, that had uh, just hit that window or were starting to, had some trucks scheduled. Uh, once they found out they had APP for serotype 15, they stopped that and then went ahead and treated the pigs uh, and delayed it basically. And so, you know, that, this, is, this is one that's high interest, right, because not all these trailers get washed between every load and, and there's a lot of contractors, third-party contractors uh, involved here. And so lots and lots of hazards, lots of uncertainties, lots of unknowns. Uh, so that piqued our interest. But, you know, the reality was is these pigs were being sent all over the state of Iowa and even Austin. Um, to Hormel there, and, and if, it, if this was what was moving around, you would have expected to see it outside that, that small geographic area a little bit more, and we just didn't see that. So the other thing that, that caught our attention with these was um, all, all of these companies, well, not all, but almost all of the companies involved here were using uh, uh, load crews and vaccine crews, right? And, and um, it's, it's interesting when you start talking about how that gets done, right? There's third, almost all third-party contracted and they may have a relationship with the head, head, head person, you know, the, the one they write the check to, uh, and they periodically ask them questions like, are you exclusive to my company? And the answer is always yes, but um, we, know, we know that they, you know, there's a lot of people involved in those, and, and if they're short of body one day and they need help getting pigs loaded, uh, they know if they don't get the job done, that they may be the last time they get the job, and if they uh, bring in somebody that might have been in a, a barn, a different company, then that, that nobody's probably going to even ask about that. So, so that's kind of interesting. We, we kind of focused on that. The other, this one was we looked at on-farm and off-farm employee entry. On-farm employee entry, of course, is the most frequent event, always is. And how that's done is kind of interesting as well. We're really pushing employees during this time, uh, do it on a routine basis anyway, but it was particularly uh, acute during this happened, you know, through the pandemic where labor shortages were we're still affecting, or still, or not still, but we're affecting the industry certainly probably even more than today, but that's ongoing. But this is, one, uh, there were two cases here too. One in particular caught, caught our attention where um, the case we were investigating, uh, they, they, because there were so many dead pigs, uh, the, the single caretaker that oversaw that site wasn't able to get them all out the door, right? And so uh, they had to bring in uh, other people. In this case, they brought in production management uh, to help them out that day. Well, it turns out they didn't have uh, on-farm boots and coveralls available for them, and so they just wore their street shoes and street clothes to get that job done. One of those two production management um, uh, individuals uh, at the end of the day um, was smart enough, I'll say, to say, okay, I better go home, and, and in other words, not go to another swine site or pig site today. Uh, the other one decided that he had to go to another pig site today. There was something he urgently needed to do. Well, about, about three or four days later, or a week later, I think it was, that site broke, right? And that wasn't one we investigated, but it, but it pretty evident that's probably how it, how it broke it there. So that's something to think about, right? When you have these emergencies, and this certainly would apply to African swine fever uh, virus as well, you know, do you have a plan in place to deal with that? Do you have <laughs> extra pairs of coveralls and boots there uh, at a minimum? All right, so what we learned uh, from this, uh, again, APP serotype 15, APP in general is not supposed to be easy to move around. Uh, it's, a, it's what's called an obligate intracellular uh, bacteria. That means it doesn't survive very well outside the pig, okay? And, and so it shouldn't be very easy to move around. And so that, this was an opportunity to, uh, to kind of explore some of these cases where, where some pretty egregious things probably happened here. Uh, dead disposal, uh, I'm pretty convinced that, that this was a big part of that. Um, you know, when, when you, when you talk, talk to companies about moving away from dead disposal, there's still a lot of uh, reluctance to get rid of rendering, right? Uh, and and uh, I get that. It's, it's more convenient, uh, generally cheaper than composting. And the way we use labor on grow, wean to finish sites or, or uh, grow finish, we really push them hard, right? And so if we have to stop and have them maintain a compost site at each site they oversee uh, every day or every other, whenever they have deads, that's really going to slow them around, down and we're going to need more people, right? And that, that's challenging. Um, 
shared resources. This is another big one. A lot of, a lot of uh, black. Bo this is really a black box here, where um, you know we. I don't think we fully understand the extent to, that we have connections not only with companies or, or farms within a company, but also between companies. And so, you know, rendering the contracted labor issue, like uh, that I mentioned before, as well as the trucking, and then the load and vaccine crews. I think that's uh, not only do we not have much control over them, but but we don't really have full understanding of all those connections there. And so that's some, an area we really need to improve. One way to deal with that, of course, is communication, right? As long as you, you know, if you're employing third-party contractors, you want to want to communicate with them. Um, Over-communicate uh, is not a bad thing, right? And tell them what you expect of them. Make sure they do that. Well, that, unfortunately, that doesn't get done either, right? Because the, the same labor shortage that we have uh, with the people on the farm also applies to the veterinarians and the, and the production management. Uh, who are the ones that would typically be the, expected to do the communication, and they don't have time to do it either. So it's a big problem, in my opinion. All right, with that, I want to thank, again, acknowledge Schick for funding this, uh, and then uh, the collaborators as well.